Hello, everyone. This is our sixth session of COVID-19 Colorado and Beyond, which means we are halfway through the lecture series. This webinar is sponsored by the University of Colorado Denver's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and its Continuing and Professional Education and Interdisciplinary Studies programs. I'm Marjorie Levine Clark. I'm a professor of history and associate dean for diversity outreach and initiatives in the college, and I'm your moderator for the series. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions during the lecture and after. We hope to get to as many of your questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Information about student credit and continuing education units can be found on our continuing and professional education website. And students interested in credit have to write a one page paper for every lecture. Today's prompt for the paper is, how does viral structure inform SARS-CoV-2 ecology, meaning where it came from, disease presentation in humans, the physiology and immunology, and potential treatments? I'll read that again. How does viral structure inform SARS-CoV-2 ecology, where it came from, disease presentation in humans, the physiology and immunology, and potential treatments? I know that's a mouthful, but the question will also be posted on the course website along with all the other questions. The lecture is also being recorded and it will be up on the website and the CLAS YouTube page as well. As usual, I want to thank the many people who made this webinar happen. First, Dean Pam Jansma and Assistant Dean Joanne Porter of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences for supporting this program and making credit available to many of our students at no cost. Our outstanding faculty who volunteered their time for this series, Mike Effler and Noah Dodaro from the Office of Information Technology, Shana Bull, Amy Arnold, and the Office of Digital Education, Interim Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Joanne Brennan, the University Registrar, Carrie John and her team, the Bursar, Associate Bursar, Eric Gray, and from CLAS, Tracy Combe, Director of Marketing and Communication, Laurel Dodds, Con Director of Continuing and Professional Education, Course and Curriculum Coordinator, Mary Lovett, and finally, Kristen Salisbury, Program Manager for Continuing and Professional Education, who oversaw putting this whole event together. Today, we have a team of lecturers from the Department of Integrative Biology. First up will be Assistant Professor Annika Mosier, who received her PhD from the Department of Environmental and Natural Resources Sciences at Stanford. She will be speaking to us today about viral structure and replication. Next, senior instructor Laurel Beck, who received her PhD in neuroscience from Michigan State University, will talk about physiological and immune responses to COVID-19. Third, associate professor and associate chair Amanda Charlesworth We'll explore how cures for COVID-19 are being developed and when we'll have one or more of them. Professor Charlesworth received her PhD in cell biology from University College London. To close out the presentation, Associate Professor Laurel Hartley, who received her PhD in ecology from Colorado State, will look at where the coronavirus came from and how we know that. Their lectures have been pre-recorded, pre so hopefully the tech gods and goddesses will be good to us today. So I turn it over to Professor Amanda Charlesworth to run the uh, recording. All right, thank you very much. Just give me a second here to get organized. Hi, my name is Annika Mosier, and I'm gonna to talk to you today about the SARS-CoV-2 viral structure and replication. So when we talk about viruses, they're often defined as obligate intracellular parasites. And they're called that because they're really simple structures that don't have their own metabolism, they can't create energy, they can't respond to the environment, and they require hosts for replication. These hosts might be animals or humans, plants, insects, as well as the unicellular organisms like bacteria and archaea. When we add up the total number of viruses on Earth, scientists estimate that there's 10 to the 31 viruses. 
Now that's a huge number. I've written out the number with all the zeros there for you to see so that you can really grasp the sense of that scale and scope. We think that there's 10 million times more viruses on Earth than there are stars in the universe. Collectively, those viruses have a really big impact on Earth. They play a really important role in maintaining the health and stability of our ecosystems. Now, when we look at those viruses, we, can, we think that there's about a trillion different species of viruses or different types or classes of those viruses. Now, of those, a really small fraction infect humans. Only 250 viral species are thought to infect humans. Now, of course, one of those is SARS-CoV-2, which is why we're all here today. The SARS-CoV-2 virus is the virus that causes COVID-19 disease. It's a coronavirus, which is named for its crown-like spikes, giving it a really characteristic um, surface structure. These viruses um, are very small. They're about 100 nanometers in diameter. You can see the picture here is depic depicting the structure. In red, you can see we have a viral genome. It's an RNA genome with positive strand. That genome encodes the information that the virus needs to replicate. Surrounding that genome, we have blue proteins called nucleocapsid proteins that wind around the genome. The nucleocapsid proteins in genome are encased in an envelope. This envelope is a lipid bilayer, and that's derived from the host. This envelope is really important because it houses the genome, it holds everything in. It also anchors the membrane proteins, and it regulates what can flow in and out of that virus. In orange, we have spike proteins, also called S proteins. Those proteins are the key proteins involved in attachment to cells during infection, as we will see. There's a few other structural proteins involved as well. Now, if we look at that genome, that genome is large. It's about 30,000 base pairs, which is big for a virus. It's two times as big as the flu genome on average. That genome codes for about 26 proteins. Now, 26 proteins is a very small number compared to higher organisms. Bacteria, for instance, make a few thousand proteins. Humans make about 20,000 proteins uh, in their cells. So those viral proteins code for some important functions. They encode the, uh, the structural components of the virus, the spike proteins, nucleocapsids, membrane proteins, and so on. And they also encode some other proteins involved in replication, such as the RNA polymerase and the protease. Okay, so when we think about infection, a person is exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That virus particle makes its way through the mucosal membranes and ultimately down into the cells, uh, the lung cells. Those lung cells are coated um, with receptor proteins called ACE2 receptor proteins. Now the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 spike protein has a really strong bond with the ACE2 receptor proteins in the lung cells. So they have kind of this lock and key mechanism where they have a, a nice tight fit. The strength of that bond is, uh, is stronger or greater than what we see in other SARS viruses. And so that it contributes, we think, to why this new virus infects humans so efficiently. Okay, so the, um, the bond between the spike protein and the ACE2 receptor protein occurs in the lung cells, but we also have ACE2 receptor protein to other types of cells, including heart cells, uh, kidney, blood vessels, gastrointestinal tract, and so on. So we think that the large number of ACE2 receptor uh, proteins in the human body contributes to why humans are particularly prone to SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID infection. Scientists are trying to figure out whether the amount of ACE2 receptor proteins in the human body impacts the likelihood for infection or the severity of the disease. For instance, certain situations like smoking or taking certain medications can alter the number of ACE2 receptor proteins that a person has. So scientists are trying to figure out whether that impacts their likelihood for getting sick. So once the spike protein and ACE receptor protein are connected and bind, we get a secondary protein called a protease, which modifies that spike protein in order to Im, um, facilitate infection. So that uh, modified protein then creates this fusion machinery where we draw together the two membranes of the virus and the host. Once those membranes are physically connected, then we can, um, then the virus distributes its RNA genome into the host cell.
So once we have the viral RNA genome in the host cell, a few things happen. First, we, uh, the, the, uh, we use the host machinery to make viral proteins. So the host, uh, the genome is called positive sense, meaning that it's ribosome ready and that the ribosomes from the host can directly begin to use uh, translation in order to make viral proteins. So second of all, we need to make more viral genomes. So the second step is to use a viral derived protein called a um, RNA dependent RNA polymerase to make copies of its own genome. So in those first two steps, we have made our viral proteins, our capsids and uh, spikes and so forth. We've made our genomes. Now the next step is to assemble those viruses, again using host machinery. So this happens in the Golgi where we then um, put together all the viral proteins and genome and surround them with a lipid, lipid um, envelope. From there then our assembled par uh, viral particles exit the cell and go on to infect new cells. You can imagine then that this can be quite damaging to a cell. So one viral infection in one cell can then make you know, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of new viral particles. So that has an energetic burden on the cell because we're using host cell machinery. It also um, can physically uh, damage the membrane as those viral particles are exiting. This can then create some of the symptoms that we see with a COVID infection. Additionally, a damaged cell then can uh, release chemicals that trigger the immune system, and this can spur an even more aggressive inflammatory response in COVID-19 patients, which uh, we will discuss later in this session. So let's look at the numbers. We can make some generalizations and estimates using the flu virus because uh, we're still learning about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but we can um, generalize using the flu. If someone gets sick with a flu, each infected cell then produces 10,000 new viruses. So that estimate, those numbers really quickly increase. Within just a few days, we have 100 trillion flu viruses within one person that's sick. So let's think about what it takes to spread um, a viral illness like flu or uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, to a new person. So that infected person is releasing viral particles. If you, in order to get infected, a person needs to be exposed to about a thousand of those viruses, the SARS-CoV-2 viruses. So let's say that infected person sneezes or coughs. One sneeze or one cough um, expels about 200 million viruses. So you can see then it would be pretty easy to inhale 1,000 viruses from that single cough or sneeze if you're in the same room with that person. Let's say that person is breathing, that uh, infected person then would be releasing about 33 viruses per minute just based on breathing alone. So given that rate, it would take about an hour of exposure to that person breathing in order to inhale a thousand viruses to potentially make you sick. Let's say that person is speaking now, we increase that rate up to about 200 viruses per minute. So it would only take five minutes of exposure to inhale 1000 viruses. So you can see all in all, it's really quite easy to get exposure to enough viruses to make you sick. It's also important to remember that asymptomatic people are still shedding viruses. So even though they don't have symptoms of illness, they can be shedding viruses and you can um, then be uh, exposed in a similar manner. So what can we do about it? So um, we luckily have good old fashioned soap and disinfectants in order to help combat SARS-CoV-2. The way this works is that um, soaps and disinfectants target the lipid membrane or the envelope of these SARS-CoV-2 viruses. So our, um, our lipid membrane is made up of phospholipids, which have a phosphate head and a lipid tail. Now these, this, these phospholipids have hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. And that what that means is that those portions of the molecule either have a tendency to bond with water or avoid water. So this is our um, viral envelope, viral membrane. And now our soap molecules have a similar chemical feature where they have also hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. So those soap molecules start to um, 
insert themselves into the viral membrane and they kind of act like a crowbar where they pry open that um, lipid membrane. Once they pry open that membrane, then the virus essentially falls apart. It had no longer has the membrane to hold everything together. So we, our lipids fall apart, our spike proteins fall off, our genome releases. And now we no longer have an intact viral particle to go through that infection and replication process that we just described. So we've effectively destroyed the virus. So soap um, works in a similar manner as we see with disinfectants, which often contain ethanol that can also um, interfere with the viral envelopes. Now we can also combat this virus with masks. We can take advantage of the size uh, of this virus. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus again is about 100 nanometers in diameter. The N95 masks, which are the, the high profile masks, so to speak, they are really effective at removing small particles. So they can remove particles in that range, 100 to 300 nanometers. So they can physically block the transfer of viruses in and out of that mask. Now the surgical and cotton masks, which are more widely available, they're less effective, far less effective for blocking these small viral particles because of the fabric, uh, nature of that fabric and the pore sizes of those fabric. However, these types of masks are in fact, are pretty good at blocking the droplets. So looking back at that sneeze and that cough, those large droplets that contain so many viruses in them, the large droplets are pretty well blocked by those surgical and cotton masks. We need to think about those masks as a two-way mechanism there. So one, we're wearing masks to block the spread of our viruses through coughs and sneezes and breathing and speaking, and then we're also blocking the inhalation of viruses to keep that number down. So finally, I just want to um, point out that we can use this information about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the genome, the structure, the replication, in order to inform science and uh, future policy practices. We can and have already used the information to develop tests um, for COVID-19 and antibodies. We can use this information to develop targets for drugs and vaccines, and also to understand the epidemiology, where this virus originated, how it's mutating, how it's spreading around the world. And we will hear more about these topics from our next speakers. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Dr. Laurel Beck from Integrative Biology, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the physiological and immune uh, changes that SARS-CoV-2 infection can induce in the body. Now, before we get started, I want to go through some of these little cheesy drawings that I made. Um, when we think about the lungs, the lungs are very important for getting atmospheric air into the body and waste products out. And a lot of this gas exchange occurs between these substructures of the lungs called alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries that sort of cruise by them. Now, when we bring air in from the atmosphere, oxygen fills these alveoli, which do have a very large sort of spherical structure, and that facilitates this gas exchange with movement from oxygen into the blood. Now, this is important because all the tissues of our body need a lot of oxygen in order to do their jobs, and so this is where this takes place in the body. Now, when that oxygen makes its way to the tissues and cells of the body, they're going to utilize it and generate carbon dioxide as a waste product. This carbon dioxide will also get into the blood and eventually make its way back to the lungs, moving from the blood into the alveoli and then to be breathed out of the body. This is like the major hallmark of what the lungs do, right? Get oxygen into the blood so it can go to the tissues and take carbon dioxide from the tissues and bring it back to the lungs so that it can be expelled. Now, a SARS-CoV-2 infection is going to impact this story of gas exchange in both direct and indirect ways. Directly, a SARS-CoV-2 infection is going to lead to some alveolar damage directly by causing some cells to lice, like Dr. Mosier talked about in her part of the talk. But indirectly, and quite honestly, more importantly, the destruction of these cells within the alveoli set off a bunch of immune-related alarms within the body, and that can only further perpetuate the inflammation response and has the potential to lead to tissue damage. But first, let's just focus on the direct impacts of a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we still have our alveoli over here, and we have the blood supply. If we zoom in on our alveolar, or alveoli. We have a series of cells that sort of make up the, the boundaries of these alveoli, and there are two major flavors of cells. 
the ones that are really important to us for our story are the type 2 pneumocytes, which I have drawn here in green. And these are a little less numerous than the other types, but they still perform very important functions for overall lung functioning. These are the cells that make surfactant, which is like a little solution that gets sort of spit out into the lumen or the space within this alveoli. And they really help reduce surface tension, and it's very important for the ease of lung inflation. Now, why this matters is because these type 2 pneumocytes have a lot of those ACE2 proteins on their surface, which makes them very strong targets for a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And if SARS-CoV-2 is inhaled, makes its way down to the alveoli, makes its way into contact with these cells, then these cells are likely to be lysed and destroyed and release more viral particles within the lumen of the lung and potentially other places as well. Now, in a healthy lung, where these type 2 pneumocytes are prevalent, making their surfactant, everything is great, the alveoli are allowed to maintain that nice large spherical shape, the ease of gas exchange is there, and the lungs can inflate and do their thing appropriately. But when you start destroying some of those surfactant producing cells, it can lead to some alveolar collapse. It can lead to more strained breathing. And not only that, but it leads to then a collection of a whole bunch of debris and other stuff and junk within the lumen or the space of these alveoli. Now, when these alveoli get damaged, they really struggle to do their job effectively, which means then you can get less oxygen into the blood for the tissues and less carbon dioxide out of the body, which is ultimately not great. So this is one way in which a SARS-CoV-2 infection can really impact respiratory physiology. But we can't forget about this part. We have all these little bits now floating around inside of our alveoli. We have viral particles, we have cellular debris, and most important for this part of the story, we have cytokines. Now, these cytokines, which are a part of this you know, junk that's floating around in your alveoli, are really important for promoting the inflammation response. And we've all experienced inflammation at some point in our lives, right? You know, you get the swelling and the redness and the sensitivity. And inflammation is a nonspecific or an innate immune response, which just helps protect the body and fight off whatever foreign proteins have made their way into the body. And so again, the goals of inflammation are to help destroy foreign proteins. We send in cells to engulf and attack cells that are um, exposing these foreign proteins and these viral particles. But the inflammation response also helps to protect our body against future reinfections at this exact moment in time. Now for our story, these lysed cells, these broken cells, damaged cells following a SARS-CoV-2 infection are going to release these things called chemokines. And these are a very specific subtype of cytokines that really serve to help attract immune cells to the area. And this is what really gets the immune response going with a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we have our damaged alveoli, we have all these little bits floating around inside of them, and these little bits and including these chemokines, don't necessarily stay inside of the alveoli. They make their way out to help, again, recruit immune cells to the site of infection. These chemokines will also help draw the attention of local macrophages. So macrophages are these types of immune cells that live naturally within the alveoli. They're found in a lot of different places that have a lot more direct exposure to the outside world. And their job is to really help clean up cellular debris, but also they can secrete a whole bunch of other flavors of cytokines. And these cytokines will help, again, also attract more immune cells to the location. But one in particular, this IL-6, seems to be very important in COVID patients. While IL-6 can help recruit more leukocytes to the site of interest, it also helps actively promote cellular destruction. And while in theory it should just be impacting those cells that have been infected with SARS-CoV-2, it has the potential to impact and lead to the destruction of other healthy cells in the area as well. Not only that, but what um, early research has pointed to is that actually this IL-6 is really, really elevated in these COVID patients. Now, IL-6 and the other cytokines don't necessarily stay in there. They also make their way out of the alveoli as well. 
So we have these chemokines coming from the damaged cells. We have IL-6 and other cytokines coming from the macrophages, and those are going to make contact with the receptors on your blood vessels. And it's going to lead to a vasodilation of those blood vessels or an expansion in diameter. Not only that, which will help increase blood flow to the area, but also these cytokines will help increase permeability of these blood vessels as well, which means that things that can't normally get out of these blood vessels like cells, and protein, and plasma now have sort of an exit point. And ultimately, this is a good part of the immune response because we want cells like white blood cells to be able to make their way from the blood supply into the alveoli so they can help fight off the infection. One of the populations that seems to be particularly important in a SARS-CoV-2 infection are these neutrophils. So once we get a vasodilation and we get a leakiness of these blood vessels, these neutrophils can move from the blood into the alveoli. And once they get there, they'll continue to secrete cytokines, but also a lot of other toxic chemicals. And again, in theory, while this would only impact those cells that are infected, it can actually lead to the destruction of healthy cells in the lungs as well. Now, not only will the neutrophils do that, but they will also help clear up some cellular debris. Um, and there's some evidence that suggests that, again, in severe COVID cases, there's actually an entrapment of these neutrophils at the location. So they will continue to stay there, continue to spit out cytokines, continue to spit out other various toxic chemicals, which can lead to extensive lung damage. Not only are there neutrophils and other types of leukocytes cruising around in the blood, but there's also these inactive complement proteins that exist in the blood, which are also a part of this innate immune response. Now, when they're just floating around in the blood, these things are pretty inactive, but once they make their way to a site of inflammation, they will then become activated. And this sets in motion a whole series of events that leads, again, to the tagging of cells that are expressing foreign proteins, but also potentially the sort of inadvertent tagging of healthy cells and can also promote their destruction as well. So with all of these cytokines that are being released initially at the site of the alveoli, you end up with this vasodilation and these leaky blood vessels, which means that these cells and these proteins and plasma itself can get out of the blood supply. And this ends up leading to issues if it goes unchecked. Now, the cytokine storm is really the effect of this sort of idea of what we call positive feedback in biology, where one thing leads to the continued production of that thing. And this is what happens with these cytokines. You get the original release of cytokines from the damaged cells and from the macrophages. You recruit more leukocytes or white blood cells to the site of infection. They continue to release cytokines, which then stimulate more and more and more. And if this goes completely unchecked, it can have some disastrous results on the lungs. Now, again, a little bit is good. That's what we want. Right? We want to recruit white blood cells. We want to make sure that we clear out all of these infected cells. But again, if it goes unregulated, it can lead to some really serious side effects. With an unregulated cytokine storm, you can get too much plasma leaving from the blood vessels, and it can lead to the alveoli, which really impacts gas exchange, right? the ability to get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. Not only that, but there are a bunch of toxic chemicals that are coming out of all of those leukocytes that have made their way into the alveoli, potentially damaging healthy cells. Furthermore, you can see additional migration of complement proteins, additional activation of complement pathways, which can also lead to the destruction of potentially healthy cells. And in some patients with the most severe COVID symptoms, it can actually lead to the development of acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. And this is characterized by fluid in the lungs, plasma getting out of those blood vessels, um, labored breathing, low blood pressure, because again, a lot of the fluid is leaking out of, <laughs> out of the blood vessels, and potentially cognitive decline and fatigue. And especially in those super severe cases of COVID, a lot of those patients end up suffering from ARDS. Now, if all of this is allowed to go unchecked and sort of get out of control like it does in those severe COVID cases, it can overall lead to hypoxic conditions within the body. You're not seeing good enough gas exchange at the level of the alveoli. Not enough oxygen is getting in, which ends up depriving the tissues of the body and has the potential to lead to organ failure. 
Now, while ventilators are great for helping to sort of get around some of these hypoxic conditions by more directly getting oxygen to those alveoli to help get it into the bloodstream, it's obviously not great and taxes our healthcare system. So it's really important that we turn our focus to some of these components of the immune system to see if we could potentially develop other therapies that way. Hi, I'm Amanda Shelsworth and I'm a cell biologist. I've worked for the pharmaceutical companies Smith, Klein and French, Merck, Sharp and Dome and Bristol Myers Squibb. And today I'm going to talk about cures for COVID-19 and when will we have them? Cures exploit differences between the healthy state and the disease state. So here's a bacteria and I'm showing you a bacteria for context. Bacteria have cell walls. Humans do not have cell walls. Bacteria have metabolic pathways to make these cell walls. Humans do not have those metabolic pathways. We can find chemicals that interfere with those metabolic pathways, and you know these chemicals as antibiotics. But today, this is about viruses, and you learned about viral structure from Dr. Mosher. And inside a virus, there are no metabolic pathways, so we have nothing to target. An antibiotic certainly won't work, so what can we do? So I'm showing you some common strategies. Again, contrasting bacteria to give you some perspective. So here's a list of some bacterial diseases, cholera, salmonella, staph, strep. Antibiotics can cure these diseases. What about viral diseases, hepatitis, measles, smallpox? The only tools we have for these diseases, because we can't cure them, is vaccination to prevent infection in the first place. Now, in recent years, hepatitis C, HIV, and influenza can be treated with antivirals. And what these do is they slow down the replication cycle of the virus, so the patient's own immune system can keep up. So I'm going to talk about three strategies, slowing down that replication cycle, modulating the immune system to try and treat the symptoms, and preventing infection in the first place with a vaccine. So I'm showing you this to illustrate that it can take a long time to develop a new drug. So not only do you have to find a chemical that targets the disease state and not the healthy state and make sure it works in intact animals with no side effects and you've got a manufacturing process to make pure product with no impurities, then you have to get it into humans, into phase one trials and then phase two and then phase three and each of these steps can take years. But we're in a pandemic now. Can we speed this up? So I took this quote from this article. Rather than taking years to develop and test compounds from scratch, the World Health Organization and others want to repurpose drugs that are already approved for other diseases and have acceptable safety profiles. So let's start with strategy one, slowing the replication cycle. This is an outline of the replication cycle and you saw something similar from Dr. Mosher. This is the virus, here's the spike protein, here's the ACE2 receptor. That interaction allows genetic material to come into the cell where a large polypeptide is made that then gets chopped up into smaller proteins. Some of those proteins uh, then go on to replicate the virus's genetic material. Some of those proteins go on to package that genetic material into a new virus particle for release. Remdesivir was originally developed for Ebola and it works at this step here. It slows down or prevents the replication of uh, viral genetic material. So, is this working for COVID-19 patients? And the answer is, yeah, it seems to be shortening the hospital stays of some of COVID-19 patients. It's also entering a new trial to see if it can be used as a preventative, but we don't know the answer to that yet. Hydroxychloroquine was originally developed for malaria, and it's also used to treat lupus and rheumatism, and it's thought to act on this mechanism of entry into the cell. So this is different than the ACE2 mechanism. Here the virus comes in in an intact compartment and has to get out of the compartment to infect the cell. Hydroxychloroquine is thought to prevent that step. So 
Does it do anything for COVID-19 patients? No, it doesn't. But it is entering new trials to be used as a preventative, and we don't know the answer to that yet. Lopinavir and ritonavir were developed for HIV, and they act at this step here. They prevent the chopping up of this larger polypeptide into these small functional proteins. So does this work for COVID-19? No. What about convalescent plasma? So this works at this part of the infection cycle here, and this is where blood from a patient who's recovered from COVID-19 is taken, the antibodies are extracted, and given to a second patient, and they coat uh, the virus particles, those antibodies bind to the spike protein, they prevent interaction with the ACE2 receptor and prevent infection that way. Does it work? Actually, yeah, it does. But this is a really sophisticated medical procedure and it only occurs in hospitals, but it is there as a last resort. What about strategy two, modulating the immune system? So the first question is, do we suppress or boost? And you learned from Dr. Beck that the immune system is actually causing a fair amount of damage itself, so maybe we should suppress it. But if we do that, how are we going to clear the virus? Maybe we should boost it. Well, maybe the answer is both. And this is what this strategy is right here. So maybe early on in the infection cycle, in the first couple of days, maybe we boost those initial cytokines that rev up the immune system. And one of them is interferon beta. And that's already used in multiple sclerosis. And then in the middle of the infection, this is where there's the hyperinflammation. Maybe at this point we should be suppressing the immune system. And this is where dexamethasone comes in. It's a general anti-inflammatory and it works on those leukocytes that you've just learned about. And it reduces the levels of cytokine that they're releasing and it reduces that cytokine storm. And the great news is it's already been shown to reduce mortality. A cytokine that's particularly elevated in COVID-19 patients is IL-6. And there's a drug, tocilizumab, that is uh, designed specifically to target IL-6, and that's already being used in autoimmune disorders. And then maybe at the end of the infection, so after this inflammation is under control, maybe it's time to boost the immune system again to clear the virus. And this is where we introduce a new immune cell. T cells. And these uh, um, treatments here, IL-7 is a cytokine that revs up T cells and it's already used in sepsis. Nivolumab uh, reactivates T cells in cancer patients. But the problem with nivolumab is that it can bring on a cytokine storm itself. And so whenever you're modulating the immune system, this has to be done under really close medical supervision because of the Jekyll Hyde nature of the immune system. So what about strategy three, prevention of infection in the first place? So we have to talk about immunity first. So this is the infection cycle again, this is the virus being released from that cell. You already learned about macrophages, how they clear up all the cellular debris from the first round of damage of the viruses. And these macrophages, after picking up these uh, viruses, they present little pieces of viruses to immune cells, different immune cells. So we're talking about T cells and B cells. And this arm of the immune system doesn't really get going for a couple of days. It's delayed compared to inflammation. But after a couple of days, the B cells are making the antibodies that bind to the spike protein to neutralize the virus. And the T cells are destroying viral infected cells. But here's the clever part about this part of the immune system. T and B cells make memory cells. And it's the memory cells that provide immunity. So T memory cells and B memory cells. The next time there's an infection and the macrophage presents particles of uh, virus to these T cells and B cells, they get on the job so fast, you don't get sick. And the best bit, you don't spread the disease either. 
And so this is what vaccines are. They provoke an immune response without using a deadly virus. So where are we? Well, there's about 100 candidates in development at various stages. The one that seems to be furthest along is AstraZeneca. It just entered phase three human trials. It is a common cold virus that is um, expressing a spike protein, a SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, so it's a hybrid virus. And I'm pointing out this um, uh, strategy, uh, this candidate right here, CSU here in Colorado, what they're doing is they're taking a whole SARS-CoV-2 virus and they are destroying the genetic material so it can't replicate. Now, this is working so far in their animal model. They have hamsters that are immune to COVID-19. But because this hasn't got into humans yet, this is going to be a couple of years before it's available um, for mass use if it works. So this is where we are. Um, we've got remdesivir to slow the replication cycle and we've got dexamethasone to reduce mortality. But there are other strategies being pursued so this is not the end of the story just yet. And then we've got a hundred candidates for um, uh, potential vaccines. Uh, some are very far along, stage three already, uh, but there's plenty of others behind them if this one does not work. So definitely in a couple of years. So here I will pass you on to Dr. Hartley. Hello, I'm Dr. Laurel Hartley. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Integrative Biology. I work on the ecology of bubonic plague in Colorado and teach infectious disease ecology at CU Denver. Disease ecology is a subdiscipline of ecology that deals with how the environment affects disease spread and how disease spread affects the environment. We all know that COVID-19 is a newly emerged zoonotic disease that is spilled over from bats. What I would like to do is explain the terms emerging, zoonotic, and spillover. Then I'll address what's so special about bats. This painting from 1809 depicts a man with tetanus. From historical writings and art, we know that some diseases have been in humans a very long time, so we don't know where they originated or how they originated. Other diseases are new. We call these emerging diseases. An emerging disease is one that has been newly discovered or evolved, increased markedly in incidence, increased in geographic range, or moved into a new species. Coronavirus, or SARS coronavirus 2, would meet all of these criteria. As a different example, Zika is a disease that emerged globally a few years ago. It wasn't a new pathogen in that we knew it existed in various parts of the world. It spread to new parts of the globe, and that was surprising to many. At least 70% of emerging diseases that humans presently face are zoonotic in origin. A zoonotic disease is a disease that normally exists in other animals, but that can be transmitted to humans. Spillover from one species to another species is very common. Humans are animals after all. Spillover is, is when a disease moves from its original host to a new host species. This happens all the time, but if it happens all the time, why don't we see more epidemics? Most of the time, the human immune system clears the pathogen before it can be transmitted from human to human. In other cases, the pathogen is so virulent that it kills the first case before a chain of infection from human to human can be established. For spillover to result in an epidemic or a pandemic, the pathogen has to be transmissible from human to human and a chain of infection must persist. You might have heard of the term R0. For an epidemic to occur, R0 has to be above 1. That means that each case gives rise to one or more cases on average. So how does spillover occur? This is a question that ecology can help answer. For spillover to happen, there has to be niche overlap between the original hosts, the pathogen, and humans. Here's an example of how ecology helped discover the origins of Nipah virus. When Nipah virus emerged, scientists tracked cases and saw that there was a higher prevalence of cases during date palm sap harvest and consumption. This image shows a person installing a tap and collector bucket for date palm sap. Using motion-activated cameras, scientists were able to see that bats would visit these collectors in the night. They would drink above them, perch on them, and defecate or urinate in them. The bats were spreading the virus. 
Spillover can be a single event with two species, the human and the original host, or more often, it's a complex set of events. This is the scenario for Ebola virus. Bats are the original host of Ebola. Humans can get Ebola directly from handling or consuming infected bats or fruit contaminated by bat saliva. Or humans can get Ebola from consuming or handling infected intermediary hosts that got the virus from bats. As I mentioned earlier, 70% of emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic in origin. Ecologists like me believe that spillover is, a, is leading to more zoonotic outbreaks because of ecological changes in our environment. For example, agricultural practices put agriculturally important species like swine, chickens, and cattle in high densities and in places where they overlap with wildlife. In this image, you can see pigs foraging underneath where bats are roosting. Habitat fragmentation and loss changes ecological communities. This image is about Lyme disease. Urbanization or suburbanization leads to an increase in populations of white-footed mice which are the most competent hosts of all of the Lyme disease hosts. So changing environment changes the relative amount of organisms or species that you see. Increased globalization, meaning movement of people and goods, means that infected individuals or vectors can move very far, very fast. When they move, they find a new pool of susceptible humans to infect. Climate change is also increasing some infectious diseases. For example, climate change is enabling tropical mosquitoes to expand their range into more temperate regions. Okay, back to the bats. The news hasn't covered much about bats and disease until recently, and that was only because of COVID-19. However, for a long time, bats have been a major focus of disease ecologists. Here's an excerpt from a scientific paper published in 2015, and there are hundreds of papers about bats. Viruses that originate in bats may be the most notorious emerging zoonoses that spill over from wildlife into domestic animals and humans. Here are some of the notorious diseases that have come from bats. Nipah virus, Hendra virus, Marburg, Ebola, and coronaviruses, including SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2. So how do we know this? How do we know that these diseases are coming from bats? Well, ecologists, microbiologists, cell biologists, and virologists all work together to trap animals, sample their body fluids, isolate pathogens in those fluids, and compare pathogen genomes among species. SARS-CoV-2 in humans is very similar to, to coronavirus in a horseshoe bat. Until recently, US, USAID had a program called PREDICT that went around the globe working with partners to surveil animals that live among humans and take those samples and find out what was living in them. So why bats? Well, there are both ecological and immunological reasons. We'll start with the ecological. Bats and potential reservoir hosts in humans overlap in habitat. For example, bats can roost in barns where pigs, chickens, and cows are raised. Further, some bat species roost together in high densities where they can pass pathogens back and forth to one another and then bring them into the, to the rest of the environment. There are also biological and immunological reasons. Bats and humans are related. This means they have some similar pathways that pathogens can exploit. Bats also may have a peculiar immune system that allows them to harbor a variety of pathogens without getting sick. It's been hypothesized that there may be a relationship between flight and low virulence. During flight, bats show an increase in metabolic rate and thus body temperature. This is comparable to a fever response and that makes replication of infectious agents, which are temperature sensitive, less favorable. So bats can harbor pathogens without getting sick. But I want to give a disclaimer in that bats aren't villains. In fact, bats provide really important ecosystem services like pollination and eating mosquitoes. So in summary, I want to say that we exist in environments and so do other species and diseases. And understanding ecology of disease is vitally important to global health. Thanks. Well, that was great. Um, can we get you all to unmute and put your videos on so we can have some question and answer.
that was so seamless tech-wise. I'm very happy about that. Um, so we have a question to start with for Professor Mosier. Um, why do only 250 viruses infect humans? If there are so many viruses, you would think more would infect humans based on pure chance. Yeah, great question. And it's, it is, in fact, quite surprising when you look at those staggering numbers of viruses out there uh, in, uh, on Earth. Um, and the answer comes in part from, you know, viral structure and, uh, and host structure, but also some of the things that Dr. Hartley talked about with spillover. Um, part of the reason that there are so few times that this event has been successful is that, you know, we, we have to have the two animals coming into contact with each other. The virus has to persist long enough outside a host to uh, stay alive and increase the chances of that uh, likelihood of that contact. Um, as I was saying, there has to be a high enough viral load, uh, the exposure to the human in order to make them sick. Um, and perhaps most importantly, that lock and key mechanism that I was discussing between, in this case, the spike protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the ACE2 receptor on the host, um, that lock and key mechanism is very specific. So a viral structure has to be just right in order to be able to infect the host, the human host cell. So most of the viruses that we encounter um, don't have the right mechanism. They can't match up with a human host cell and can't enter a host. We block the infection right away. Um, and then of course, uh, as we discussed a little bit, um, many viruses um, are uh, able to evade, uh, they have to be able to evade the human immune system in order to build up high enough numbers to go on and spread to other humans. So our immune, sy uh, immune system is really quite effective in that way that we can actually get rid of many of the viruses that we do encounter. So it's a complex process that has many, many different variables, including others I didn't answer. And so that's why, despite the, you know, trillions of viruses out there that only a small number can infect humans. Great, thank you. Um, for Professor Beck, do bacteria and other organisms have cytokines or is it something unique to mammals? I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know, microbiologists, do you <laughs> get one for this? I'll jump in, yeah. I'll, um, no, they don't, not that I know of and nothing I've read about, um, not exactly, but they do have similar chemicals. Bacteria are able to release molecules in a similar way and they can use those molecules to communicate with themselves or with other bacterial species. There's processes called signal transduction and quorum sensing um, where they have these molecules to kind of send out messages. Um, they also can release molecules that modify the host immune system. So they're similar to cytokines, but not the exact same function. Okay, another one for Professor Beck. Why do COVID-19 symptoms or lack thereof vary so widely from person to person? Is there any way to predict how this virus will impact an individual before they are exposed to it? <laughs> No, um, <laughs> I mean, obviously there are certain, there are certain uh, factors that will predispose individuals. So uh, individuals that have like asthma or uh, COPD or other types of um, sort of lung differences can put those individuals at a higher risk, right? And we know this, but partially because their lungs are already maybe not working at 100% capacity, right? And so when you start to get in there and kind of mess with things a little bit, it makes them more susceptible to this. Um, it's the immune system. It's so weird because we always talk about it in these big global terms, but it varies so much from person to person. And so some individuals may have a much more mellow response to this particular type of virus, to these particular types of proteins, whereas others, like I said, will just go completely bananas with it to try to wipe it out. And in those cases, that tends to happen, or that tends to be more prevalent in those individuals um, that are experiencing the super severe symptoms. Thanks. Yeah, well. into that? Um, another thing to think about is the ecology of a uh, human as an environment. And one thing we don't really understand is how other pathogens that that human could have encountered in the past or be encountering currently could result in um, antibody dependent enhancement or other interactions between um, pathogens within a single person. 
Right. I mean, yeah, sorry, you reminded me of something, and now I was like, oh, right, this. Um, so for some individuals, if you've already been exposed to one flavor of coronavirus, you may already have some of that antibody memory inside of your own body. And there's some evidence, there's some papers that suggest that individuals that have already had a very similar coronavirus in the past, which a lot of times when you hear about like summer colds, a lot of those, like the cold that you get in the summer, a lot of those are actually coronaviruses. Um, and so if you've been exposed to a lot of those, then your cells may already, your immune cells may already be producing antibodies that are like close enough that it can help mitigate some of these dangerous uh, side effects. So you may get an individual that has less of a response because their body's already been sort of primed to deal with this kind of thing before. Okay. Thank you. Um, for Professor Charles Worth, um, why do vaccines take so long to make? Is it a matter of making sure that they're safe for humans or that they're effective at triggering a strong enough um, immune response? Yes and yes. So, uh, are we done? Um, so, safety is a big issue. Some of the viruses that are being designed are actually live viruses. Uh, they make the best immune response, but they're live viruses and they're weakened first. And they have to be weakened to a safe level. And that's hard to figure out. How do you know when you've got a safe level of a weakened vaccine? So that's gonna take a, a, a long time to figure that one out. And then the, at the other end of the scale, some of the simplest vaccines are um, just uh, directly against, say, like the spike protein. Um, it's uh, a very small part of the virus. It's, um, what's it called, a toxoid. It's a toxoid vaccine. And is it going to work? And so we don't even know if something as small as just giving a, uh, the spike protein is even going to provoke an immune response. And the only way we can figure that out is by trying it and testing it. And it takes, while the immune system can kick in fairly quickly to see these lasting effects of an immune response, we're talking months at a time. And so each round of um, optimization takes months at a time. So yes, safety, and whether it's going to work, yes, all takes time, yes. Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure who this is directed to, but with a larger virus genome than other viruses, is this one more likely for mutations to occur? I can take that. Um, in, yeah, in essence, the, the more copies, the longer the genome, the more chances there are to make a mistake. So as the virus is trying to make copies of its genome during the um, replication cycle, the longer it has to go, the more chances there are for mistakes to occur. Um, fortunately for us, the rate of mutations is actually quite low for this um, virus. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus is mutating quite slowly, which is good because that means that it's less likely to gain a mutation that impacts its infection and the severity of that infection. So sometimes with viruses, we see as they're mutating, they can become even more infectious or more dangerous. So with this virus, it's mutating quite slowly, um, which um, can help us in terms of predicting how this um, pandemic is going to play out. It can also help us in developing these treatments and vaccines to minimize the likelihood of a change happening in the future, um, negating the effects of those treatments and vaccines. This virus has a proofreading enzyme, so it has the ability to go through its genome and check for mistakes and fix those. So that has helped in this case to minimize the rate of mutation. I love that language, that it has the ability to proofread itself. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, again, so why does aging cause the symptoms of coronavirus um, to become more severe with increased morbidity? Anyone? 
I mean, <laughs> just like just like with anything, right? The the longer you're alive, the more things you're exposed to, the more opportunity you have for things to maybe go slightly awry, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, you do, you do right. You see a greater incidence rate of more severe cases in older populations, right? But that doesn't mean that it's limited to that, right? It just means that those individuals may have accumulated over their years enough of these other sort of risk factors that make them more likely to develop a more severe reaction in, in some ways. Amanda. Yeah. And also, um, these sorts of things, why are, why are people more susceptible than other people? Um, I do want to make it known that yes, all of this data is being collected and it is all being analyzed. Uh, we don't know all the answers yet, but we're very certainly working on it. Now, there's a couple of um, ideas out there regarding the age of patients, and one of them is that simply the immune system doesn't work as well the older you get. And this might even impact who gets the vaccine uh, when they become available. And the, uh, the last lecture in the series is about vaccines, and so you might hear more then. Uh, and the other uh, piece of research that's going on at the moment, and I don't know what the outcome of this is going to be, is that it might be the, the state of the blood vessels, which um, so uh, children have very flexible blood vessels. As you get older, they harden. There is a change in the blood vessels and this might also contribute as well. And it might be the state of the blood vessels. So there's all sorts of ideas out there. Um, there's lots of research being done. We just don't have all the answers yet. Right. But we are seeing a lot of young people now um, testing positive for, for the virus as well. Right. Yeah. Probably because they're being less careful, um, right? about using masks and social distancing, uh, right? But their morbidity is, is lower. Yeah. Right. Morbidity, yes. Yes. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. Oh, no, one more just popped up. Let's see. Does age have an impact on the ability to be a carrier or to infect others? That is also a good question. Again, I don't think we know the answer to that. The only thing I have read, and um, uh, one of the earlier lectures was making this point, a lot of what we know, what we think we know at the moment, is coming from preprint servers. And so these are studies that have not been rigorously ripped to shreds <laughs> like we like to do in science. Uh, but one thing I have read is um, children may not be as infectious as adults. I haven't seen anything about older people being more, older adults being more infectious than younger adults. The only thing I've seen is children, but again, these are all studies from preprint servers, and we have to wait for that body of knowledge, multiple studies, to give us the answers to these questions. Um, do we know where viruses evolved in the first place? Uh, as it mentioned, as was mentioned, they've been around since the beginning of human time. Um, I guess that would be me. Um, well, the question was the question where they evolved in the first place. Where, um, how, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, honestly, I haven't read a lot about um, the evolution of viruses in the first place. Um, there's a lot of theories about bacteria 
and um, viruses require a host in order to uh, replicate. So I would guess that they would have evolved after um, they had suitable hosts. Um, but for bacteria and archaea, the really simple microbes that are thought to have evolved early on Earth, um, they are, you know, there's a lot of hypotheses uh, about where that might have happened, like hydrothermal vents or um, um, even, you know, warm ponds where we can get organic matter and an energy source. Um, there's uh, experiments that have shown that we can get really simple cell-like structures given the right chemical and physical conditions in the environment. So um, I have not read a lot about evolution of viruses, but I would again guess that it happened pretty early on, the very simple structures that um, have the ability to replicate as long as they have a suitable host. All right, and I think this is our final question. Um, if bat saliva, urine, et cetera, dries, can it still spread disease? I can take that one. Um, yes and no. It depends on the, the pathogen that's being spread. Some viruses and bacteria are hardy and they'll last a long time. Some are pretty wimpy and they won't last very long. So it depends on, it depends on what it is inside that saliva or urine. But there, it's definitely true that, that dried material, fecal material in urine could spread disease for sure. Right. Well, thank you all. This was, and thank you for your seamless video. It was wonderful. And I feel like I learned so much today. Um, great. So next week, uh, we have Lisa Karanin, who's chair of the communication department. And her lecture is going to be on how language shapes how we understand pandemics. So I'm um, really looking forward to that. Thank you again to Professor Hartley, Beck, Charlesworth, and Mosier. Great. See you next week, so everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.